Welcome museum members and friends to tonight's member event. My name is Marisa Gomez. I'm the public programs manager at the Santa Cruz Museum of Natural History and I am joined as always by our collections manager Kathleen Aston. Hello Kathleen. Um, and then tonight we are also really thrilled to have with us Jenny Daly who is the museum curator for the Santa Cruz District of California State Park. Hello Jenny. Um, and before I hand things over to these two honored guests, I am going to just reshare my screen again uh, and share a little bit about what brings us here today. Uh, so tonight's program is part of the series CZU and U, which I'm sure most of you joining us today have sort of been looped into in, in some way. Um, and it's in partnership with Santa Cruz Public Libraries. And it's a month of programs meant to support our community as we remember the events of last year's CZU lightning complex fires in the Santa Cruz mountains. And events include online presentations as well as programs in nature and cover a variety of topics meant to support your recovery efforts, preparedness for the current and future fire seasons and deepening ecological understanding when it comes to fire in our region. So I hope you join us for, for other events in this series. Um, and while we won't be able to see you or hear your voices for tonight's program, we still want to hear from you. And uh, thanks to everyone who has already shared in the chat how long you've been a member. As I said, tonight's program is a perk for our museum members because your support helps us to steward our collections. And it's important to us that we in turn connect you to those collections. That's what we're here to do. And um, we do want to continue to hear from you throughout the night. So please take a moment to adjust who you are sending your messages to. Um, there's different options depending on what version of Zoom you have apparently. So either choose everyone or panelists and attendees, whichever is like the broader group of options that you have. Um, and go ahead and respond to this prompt using the chat. So today we're gonna to be considering a large scale evacuation process of really just priceless objects. Uh, but I'm sure we've all at least considered what it would be like to have to evacuate our own homes or in all likelihood, have actually had to do just that, especially after the events of last August. So maybe take a um, moment and consider this. What is the most important object you would save in the case of an evacuation? Uh, like I said, it's a pretty relevant question for tonight's program. It's also kind of personal, <laughs> um, but take a moment, think about it and maybe share your thoughts if you are willing. And uh, we hope you'll continue to communicate with us using the chat throughout the program. And at the end, we'll have time to reflect upon what you've shared as a group and address any questions you may have. I also want to acknowledge that the Santa Cruz Museum of Natural History resides in the traditional and unceded territory of the Yupi tribe of the Awaswas Nation. Today, these lands are stewarded by the Amamutsun Tribal Band, who are working hard to fulfill their obligation to creator, to care for and steward Mother Earth and all living things through relearning efforts and the Amamutsun Land Trust. And we were grateful to um, launch this series, CZU and You, with a talk from members of the Land Trust. And we have a recording of that, which I can also share in a follow up email with you all. I'm going to stop sharing my screen now um, because it's time to hand things over to our speakers. Uh, we're going to be learning about State Park's response to the fires and the evacuation processes from Jenny Daly. And after Jenny speaks, we're also going to hear from our own Kathleen Aston who's gonna share a little bit about the museum's response to the fires. So without further ado, Jenny, why don't you take it away? All right, so I'm just gonna share my screen here. Perfect. Okay, okay. Uh, hello everyone, welcome. Um, first, I'd like to say thank you to Kathleen and Marisa for inviting me. Um, uh, to talk about my story, you know, the story of, of the state park's response to the CCU fire. Um, I'm honored to be here. Also, thank you to all of you members for supporting your local museum. It's very important. Um, just a little brief bit about me. Uh, my name is Jenny Daly. I'm the museum curator for the California State Parks in the Santa Cruz district. Um, I grew up in Santa Cruz, so I'm fortunate to be able to work in my hometown. I've been working with the state park since 2019. So it was pretty fresh when the fire hit in the summer of 2020. Um, I studied anthropology and archeology span as an undergrad 
And then I fell in love with working in museums. And so I decided to get a master's in museum studies with a focus in collections management. So then I worked in a couple of museums around the Bay Area, and um, but always wanted to work for state parks because this, this is such an interesting position. It sort of is a meeting of my interests with museums, but then also with our beautiful local parks. Um, I imagine that you all are pretty savvy about museums, but perhaps maybe you didn't, you don't immediately associate the state parks with having museum collections, um, but we do. We have about 15 or more parks in this area that have either historic collections or some kind of museum type visitor center display that has objects. Um, in fact, we probably have about 15,000 individual items in our collection across the whole district. Um, so that's a bit about me. I also do wanna say, you know, I'm gonna show some pretty intense images of the fire and the fire response. And so it's gonna be, it might be a little sad. It's gonna be sad. I have tissues there <laughs> just in case. Um, but so I just want to say that. Uh, so this is just a basic about the, the CZU fire. Um, this, I chose this slide because it shows the boundary of the fire, but then also where all of our state parks fall within that fire. Um, a little summary about the, the fire was that in the early morning hours of Sunday, August 16th, uh, 2020, there was a very uncharacteristic dry lightning storm, and it sparked numerous fires across um, across the state, but in northern Santa Cruz County and also southern San Mateo County. Um, by late August, or by late Tuesday, August 16th, some changes in the weather conditions allowed the multiple fires to grow and merge and start to burn out of control. Um, this was collectively known as the CZU Lightning Complex Fire, which ultimately burned 86,000 acres, uh, destroyed 1,500 structures, and burned for 38 days, and is still burning in some areas, as this slide shows some of the flare-ups in January of this year. Um, so as you can see, there were a few uh, state parks that were affected by the fire. Um, so multiple park units were um, affected by this event. Um, and it was, it was a profound change to some of our cultural resources in the district. Um, you know, I just want to say uh, personally, like I remember going, this is my uh, backyard <laughs> where I live in Bonnie Dune. Um, I remember on, I think it was Tuesday morning, I went up and I drove up to Waddell Creek and I saw a bunch of Cal Fire trucks there, maybe 20 Cal Fire trucks. And I thought, they've got this, no problem. You know, the fire's contained on the, the top of the bluff. It's, it'll be fine, but you know, little did I know that despite even that large Cal Fire presence in that evening, which this picture of my backyard was taken on the evening of Tuesday, um, the 18th, you know, little did we know that it would ultimately become so destructive. Uh, so in addition to evacuating collections for state parks, I also evacuated myself and my, with my parents and our pets and our, you know, photos and computers basically, and some food. And we went into Santa Cruz and we ended up being evacuated for about four weeks. So, so all of this brief bit that I'll explain, you know, all of this evacuating that we were doing, I was also evacuated, but then a bunch of my state parks coworkers were also evacuated. And I was fortunate enough to be able to go back home after the four weeks, but not everybody was, you know, quite so fortunate. Um, so I just wanna say here briefly, these were all of the parks that were affected by the CZU fire. 
you know, it was Año Nuevo, Big Basin, also the Rancho Del Oso portion of Big Basin, uh, Butano, Henry Cowell State Park and the Fall Creek unit, and then also our district archaeology collections that are stored at Henry Cowell, um, Portola Redwoods and Wilder Ranch. Um, so I'm going to sort of go through each park and kind of talk about what happened and what we did, uh, starting with Big Basin. You know, many of you know it was the oldest state park in California, established in 1902, um, up in the town, uh, up in the mountains near the little town of Boulder Creek. Uh, it had a historic core of buildings that were built in the 1930s by the CCC. And um, there were also staff residences, you know, campgrounds, lots of trails, waterfalls. You know, it was a well loved area. Um, the museum collections were stored in our nature lodge, which is where the museum was, also in the back archive room of the nature lodge, as well as in the, the headquarters building in the Semper, Semper Virens room. And then as well as in the old lodge, which was not open to the public, but it did have museum collections stored in there. And this is an image of our archive room um, before the fire. So, uh, oh, and then so the, the collection itself was about 700 individual museum collection items. It was mostly photographs and postcards, also memorabilia. There was a historic taxidermy collection. There was natural history specimens, logging equipment, um, ethnographic collections, and memorabilia from the Girl Scout and Boy Scout camp days of like the 40s, 50s, and 60s. Um, but unfortunately, these were destroyed. And I'm going to show the, the archive and museum after the fire. So you can see here, this is the corner of the, um, the building that had our museum over to the left is where the archive room was. Um, again, it was, a, it was a bit of a surprise to me that this was destroyed because, you know, I thought that, that there was enough Cal Fire that it would contain everything, but I think we were all pretty surprised by it. I had started getting some texts from my boss on Tuesday night saying, okay, we need to start evacuating Big Basin, what should we grab? And at that point it was already too late for me to get up there. So, you know, I, I said that we should grab um, as much stuff out of the archive room as we can. Um, fortunately, unfortunately, you know, the, the, the museum building had just been renovated because we were gonna re, we were gonna install new exhibits. So half of the collection was still packed in boxes. So it could have been transported out pretty easily because it was all packed up and ready to go. But unfortunately, it was such a scramble to get um, the staff who live in Big Basin and the campers out of their campground that they weren't able to get anything out of the, the museum. Uh, and so, but we didn't quite know the extent of the damage for a couple of days. And then I think it was by a day or two later, we were able to confirm that it was a total loss. As you can see, uh, you know, this is an image of those cabinets in our archive room that had all of our museum collections. Um, we were able to tour the damage in early September, which is what when these images were taken. Um, we had to get a special state parks escort because it was still an active fire region. Um, but we just wanted to see it with our own eyes, you know, confirm what had happened. Um, and so that kind of brings us up to now for, for Big Basin. Uh, you know, the future of the park is still being assessed right now. Uh, we have a new website that's just launching called Re Reimagining Big Basin that's going to keep the public and everyone updated on the progress for rebuilding. Um, it might take a long time. I think it's going to be a quite some time, a few years before any significant infrastructure is built, although possibly parts of the park could open sooner. Um, but 
as you can see, you know, our collections were totally destroyed. So we are starting to do a push to collect uh, new collections for Big Basin. So if anybody wants to reach out to me and offer donations um, of, you know, objects that they have that they feel like they could donate to the park, you know, photographs, memorabilia, um, anything associated with the camping and the Girl Scout camps and the Boy Scout camps, anything related to the, the people um, who had an influence on the park over the century that it existed, um, feel free to reach out to me. We also are trying to sort of rebuild the archive which was in there. So if, if you or anyone you know had been to the archive and maybe made copies of the material in the archives, also reach out to me because we'd like to get those copies. Um, so then the next part of Big Basin is Rancho Delo. So that's the, the coast side portion of the park, um, you know, just off of Highway 1 near Waddell Creek, where Waddell Creek meets the ocean. Um, there's a historic house in this area that belonged to the Hoover family, and it is what now contains our Nature and History Center. Um, there's also a small welcome center on the other side of the marsh. Um, miraculously, both of these buildings survived. Um, I think that was due in part to our State Parks Rangers and Cal Fire who were able to save those two structures. Um, the collections at, at Rancho Del Oso are mostly um, the items that are on display in the Nature Center. But then this image here is our collection storage room, which has core collections of objects that belonged to the Hoovers and that have been sort of collected or found on site over the years and then donations from um, other people over the years. And so it's about 400 objects at Rancho Deloso, um, mostly books, natural history specimens, um, taxidermy and logging and dairy equipment. Um, and then these are our collections from our storage room packed into a van. So on the Wednesday after the fire broke out, um, the interpreters and the rangers went into that storage room and they evacuated almost all of the collections from there and packed it into this van, which usually lives at Año Nuevo. Um, and so they, you know, still thinking that, that the buildings were in danger of, of being destroyed. So they moved everything in this van. Also, some of the maintenance staff came in and took the taxidermy and items off of display and also moved it over to Año Nuevo and um, basically just to try to get it out of harm's way. You know, but then by Friday, I was still concerned that Año Nuevo might possibly burn because the fire was, in, was getting close there. So we went up through the fire zone and went to Año Nuevo and grabbed this van and drove it back to Santa Cruz for safekeeping. Um, so then the next park that was affected was Wilder Ranch. So we all know and love Wilder Ranch. It's off of Highway 1, just about two miles north of Santa Cruz. Um, the Historic Preserve at Wilder Ranch has a collection of historic houses, um, barns, and other outbuildings. The oldest structure is the Balkoff Adobe which was built in the 1830s. Um, and then quite a few of the structures were built by the Meter family and the Wilder family between the 1860s and the 1940s. And um, the museum collections are stored in various locations throughout the park, uh, both objects on display in the houses. If you've ever taken a tour through the Victorian, you've seen a lot of the household wares and the furniture and the artwork on display in the buildings. Um, but there's also a collection storage area upstairs. And, um, and there's just, there's stuff all over Wilder Ranch in, in the machine shop, in the carpentry shop, in the horse barn, in the cow barn you know, in the granary building, it's, it's all together, it's about 6,000 individual objects make up the museum collections at Wilder Ranch. 
Um, so this is a slide of our collection storage room after we evacuated all of the contents out of the room. Um, and then here's my picture that I took of on the day we were evacuating. So it was on Thursday after the fire. It was myself and a few of our, actually a lot of our interpretive staff and also docents. So it was a pretty big crew of us were um, just furiously trying to evacuate the collections because again, we thought it was in danger. The fire was going down empire grade into the upper reaches of Wilder Ranch. And, you know, so we were worried. We were very worried that it would get to the historic core. So um, we basically evacuated almost everything from that one storage room, as well as as much as 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 much as we could grab that was on display. And it was packed into staff vehicles and cars and moved over to the Santa Cruz mission. Um, let's see, we also packed up all of the accession files. So all of the hard copy records that prove that we own the objects, which is if you're a museum nerd like me, it's very important to have that documentation of ownership. Um, that was also packed up and moved, as well as my office was packed up and moved. Um, but then by midday, one of these, or actually two of these moving trucks arrived. You can see the moving truck in the image. And so we had a moving truck sent from Sacramento and we had movers. So we decided to grab as much of the furniture as we could fit into the truck. Because again, it was like, let's just grab as much as we can. Um, so we filled up that truck, you know, we had furniture, we had um, more, more curatorial material from the old curatorial office, um, stuff from the visitor center, um, more research material, you know, horse tech from the horse barn, more stuff from the machine shops and the carpentry shop, and basically anything we could kind of grab or anything that seemed valuable or a core collection. You know, there are a lot of things still at Wilder Ranch that were there when it became a state park. So we call those the core collections, things that were owned by the Wilders. Um, so we tried to grab as much of that as possible. Um, there was also on that day, we had our maintenance crews uh, clearing the brush away from the buildings. I don't think you can see it there, but um, trying to really trim the you know, the shrubbery and the trees and sort of the excess vegetation away from the buildings. Um, and then they also went in and tried to patch up any like open eaves or holes or cracks in the building to prevent embers from going in and starting a fire. Um, because again, everybody was really motivated at this point because of the losses at Big Basin. So we thought really we should, you know, work as hard as we can to try to save Wilder Ranch. Um, we even, so this is an image in Sacramento of all of our furniture from Wilder Ranch that ended up in Sacramento in, from that moving truck. Um, we even moved the cars out of the garage. Those were probably the largest things that we moved in the whole evacuation of all the parks was moving the two historic cars and pushing them up the hill to the main parking lot, hoping to at least get them out of harm's way. Um, but then over, over the weeks and months following the fire, as the threat diminished, it was kind of fell on me to organize our collections that were over at the mission, try to make some sense of it, and then work with the interpretive crew to get as much of that material back to Wilder Ranch. And so it was like, a couple months long process to try to get that material back. Um, a lot of people helped and contributed and I'm really grateful for that. Um, we also, as we were returning items to Wilder Ranch, we decided to inventory what had been moved, which was a big task, um, as well as try to photograph it and sort of document its current condition, which is also a big task. Um, let's see. 
which then I'm going to talk about Henry Cowell. So, you know, Henry Cowell is our park in Felton. It's uh, right off of Highway 9. You know, it's a beautiful redwood park. Um, there's a, a nice historic building that has our visitor center in it. And, uh, you know, the visitor center presents the story of sort of the logging and limestone quarrying industry of the area. Um, and so what's on display is material related to that as well as the flora and fauna of the area. Um, there's only about 30 items in the visitor center. It's not too packed, um, but the, the majority of the museum collections at Henry Cowell are in our district archeology span lab, which is here in the district headquarters in the maintenance yard. Um, it's all of the material that has been excavated in our parks over the past 30 years, uh, mostly through various field schools done by UCSC or Cabrillo College, you know, in connection with state parks. Um, and it's about 3,000 items, uh, 3,000 individual pieces are stored in our archaeology lab. So it's a very large collection. So this is a picture of the archaeology collections as they were being returned. Um, you know, we, that Thursday when so much activity was happening at Wilder, those two big moving trucks were first at the archaeology lab and they packed, they took all of the boxes of material out of the archaeology lab as well as all of the park unit files and research and uh, my supervisor, Mark Hilkema's files of like his whole career basically was all packed in these, at least one of the two trucks and all of that material as well as the Wilder Ranch material ended up going up to Sacramento for safe storage. Um, the visitor center material was moved to uh, um, natural bridges as thinking it would be out of harm's way there. Um, and so it was staged there for a while and then eventually we moved it back. And this is an image of us reinstalling the mountain lion in our visitor center at Henry Cowell. Um, let's see. Now I'm gonna talk about Anya Nuevo. So, so this is another coastside park um, just north of Rancho del Oso. Um, it's on the, you know, the west side of Highway 1. It's mostly known for its uh, elephant seal colony and all of the activities associated with that throughout the year. But it's also a historic dairy farm, uh, the Steel family dairy. And so there's a historic barn, there's a historic creamery building, and there is a horse barn as well. Um, also part of Año Nuevo is Cascade Ranch, which is another historic ranch dairy property associated with this family. Um, and then, so this is an image of a small cemetery that's at Cascade Ranch. And the fire burns through this area pretty intensely, it damaged the cemetery, but also destroyed a few of the, quite a few of the structures at at Cascade Ranch, including our, our historic barn, which was, you know, another devastating loss. Um, there wasn't too much collections material stored in the barn, thankfully. Um, and then most of the collections material that was in the historic complex in the Dickerman barn, in the horse barn, was packed up by the interpreters and also moved to the mission for safe storage. And, you know, there's probably about 200 objects in the Año Nuevo collections. Here's an example of one of the cases, our ethnographic case, you know, all of this material ended up getting packed up and moved to the mission so it would be safe. Um, since there was no damage to the historic complex on the Año side, we were able to move all the collections back over time. Um, and again, they got inventoried and photographed. Um, and then I want to talk about Butano, which is our little park off the beaten path 
up near the town of Pescadera. And here's an image of our visitor center. So one of the challenges for the people who were evacuating collections is, uh, you know, there were owls hanging from the ceiling. So they had to take the ceiling tiles out so they could get the owls out. Um, but all of the taxidermy that was in this space ended up getting evacuated and also went to um, the mission. Um, it's a very small little visitor center. There's no, there's no museum collections per se stored at Butano, but there is, as you can see, quite a bit of taxidermy. And so that was all evacuated by our park staff. And then also my supervisor, Mark, did a lot of the work to evacuate this area. Um, and here's one of our owls in a box that you would think was purpose built for an owl, but it just happened to be a random box that was the perfect size. Um, eventually, you know, over the months, everything that had been evacuated from Butano got returned, thankfully. Um, so another park that was affected was Portola. The fire just got right up to the border of the park. So, um, but again, it was something that we just didn't know if it was going to be affected the way um, Big Basin was. So a lot of the material that's in the visitor center was evacuated, including this really wonderful sign. Um, just wanted to check my time. Um, so, uh, most of the museum collections at Portola in the visitor center is the taxidermy that's on display and then a couple historic pieces like this sign and um, everything got evacuated and moved to Half Moon Bay uh, for safe storage. And then um, over time we were able to get everything back. And this is a picture of the maintenance staff uh, reinstalling the the mountain lion that was evacuated. Um, yeah, so that's that's it. I just wanted to talk a little bit briefly about the recovery and salvage process. You know, mostly mostly it it occurred at Big Basin, although we did try to look for a few things at Cascade Ranch as well. Um, so late September, we were able to go up to Big Basin and with a big team, people from the Sacramento Cultural Resources Division came down and we tried to do a survey and record all of the historic structures that were damaged. Uh, this is an image of me sifting through items in the Semper Virens room looking for artifacts. Um, Fortunately, I was able to do this work and look for objects, you know, going through what seemed like complete destruction, but we actually did find quite a few things um, from the museum collections, mostly what you would expect. This is very sturdy metal logging equipment. <laughs> so ax heads, saw blades, uh, uh, these, um, lumberjack items on the right. Um, but, you know, great. I'm, I'm really, really glad that we were able to salvage what we could. You know, it ended up being about 50 items. Um, these are some of the saw blades from the misery whip saws that we were able to save. So the handles all burned off, but the actual saw blade themselves was saved. Um, and then everything that we were able to salvage, we moved to Henry Cowell here to the district um, archaeology lab. And that's going to be temporary storage until facilities are built up in Big Basin again for us to move the collection back to. And then as people donate to the Big Basin collections, we'll store them here at Henry Cowell until we have the museum space to move them to. Um, Another thing that we salvaged was at Gazos Creek, which is in Butano Park. Um, we got this report of a forestry person who was um, surveying the, the burned area to, to bring down hazard trees, found 
a cache of silverware inside the tree stumps, the, the, the tree stumps that had been logged a century ago. Um, and so it's very odd. So we went up there, we started digging in the stumps and, and we ended up finding probably 2000 pieces of silverware. Um, also you see a candlestick, you know, tea sets, serving platters. It's a real mystery. We're not quite sure where it came from. We think it's probably material that was stolen from people's houses on the peninsula, probably in the 1970s, and then stashed inside redwood stumps. And then for some reason, never the, the thieves never came back to get them or they were caught, I don't know. So this is our fun, the fun part of it that the fire sort of revealed this piece that you know we didn't even know existed. Um, another, and I'll just kind of briefly go through the end here. Another great thing that we were able to do was we did sort of a big cleanup push in all of our visitor center spaces because we decided, well, if the collections are mostly evacuated and the building's partially empty, isn't it a great time to, to do some cleaning? So the interpretive staff, as well as docents and volunteers, like, you know, we did hours and hours and hours of cleanup, you know, mostly at Wilder Ranch, Henry Cowell, uh, at Rancho de Loso, um, at Butano, Año Nuevo, and Portola. So we tried to hit the main spaces that where collections had been evacuated. Um, and so, and then I also wanted to talk briefly about so this, the whole returning collections ends up being quite a bit of work because now it's quite, it's not quite as urgent. People have other urgent tasks to work on. And so it took a little bit longer to get everything back, but we're finally, knock on wood, a year later, we've got everything back in place. Um, you know, things went to the mission, things went to Half Moon Bay, things went to Natural Bridges, you know, things went all the way up to Sacramento. So it was kind of a big collaborative effort to try to get everything back. This one image is our maintenance staff returning the, one of the cars into the barn at Wilder Ranch. And then the other staff is the mover, moving crew who helped return Wilder Ranch collections from um, from Sacramento. So let's see. So I just wanted to kind of give a brief in conclusion. You know, some of the lessons learned here were that you know the the great things that we learned were that so many of our staff were you know motivated and willing and ready to help move collections, evacuate collections clean spaces, reinstall items, you know, really has this been, been this great, you know, collaborative push. Um, it was kind of great that everything was closed because of COVID. <laughs> That's why we were able to store museum collections in other visitor center spaces, like, like the mission, um, because it was closed to the public at the time. And so the mission ended up being the main repository of all of these evacuated collections because it was a it was out of harm's way and it was a it's a pretty safe um, area for collections. Um, and then another pro is we had this great opportunity to to clean these spaces and give a little bit of care and attention, um, you know, especially to some spaces that had quite a bit of ash and dust and dirt from the fire build up in the spaces. We also were able to clean the artifacts as well. So the image on the left is one of the rooms at the mission where we had stored evacuated collections. That's all boxes of material from Wilder Ranch in there. Um, some of the cons were that we kind of evacuated, I, I think we evacuated more than we needed to evacuate. It's a little bit tricky to say because it was, just all hands on deck, try to save as much as you could. But 
as far as like taxidermy, we could have focused just on the endangered species that we have and maybe skip other things like the owls that, you know, if it was destroyed, we could probably get another owl specimen pretty easily. Um, and then since a lot of focus was on, on evacuating things that were on display, some of the items in storage were missed. And some of those items in storage are the actual core collections. So material that was owned by the families or the entities that owned the land before they became parts, like the wilder family, you know, clothing that we have in our collection, which actually did get evacuated. But there's some other things like at Rancho de Loso that maybe were missed that should have been taken. And I think that's because um, what we really didn't have was like a list of priority objects of things to evacuate. Um, and then, you know, another con is that some of the taxidermy was damaged during the evacuation, like this owl, his head is at a little bit of a rakish angle <laughs> that's not quite natural. So his head is almost detached here. Um, and then the mountain lion from Portola was damaged as well and a couple other pieces. So, so then we have to, you know, repair those items or ask our taxidermy conservator to repair them and then it just you know adds to sort of the cost of, of everything. Um, but, and then my final slide is, uh, these are our interpreters that help. This photo was taken on the last day of moving wilder collections from the mission. And so the biggest lesson learned was just the value of having a dedicated staff um, and then the things that we are hoping to work towards are like having um, evacuation plans updated and in place and ready to go and having all staff familiar with those plans. The plans will have a priority list of objects of things that need to be saved. Um, a cache of emergency supplies would be great. And then, um, you know, having things, another lesson is having things in storage already packed up in boxes is a great way to evacuate items. Um, and so, you know, it's just uh, a lot of lessons learned. It was a big uh, event with a big response and I'm grateful for all of my coworkers for helping out with it. So, so that's it. Well, thank you. Wow, what an endeavor, Jenny. Like. It, yeah, it's just kind of mind boggling for, and I'm sure for Kathleen too, coming from, you know, a, a museum that has a museum collection and y'all are dealing with so many parks that were impacted all at once. I've gone through so many feelings in the past 30 minutes. Sometimes. Yeah. Well, yeah, like your first slides where you were showing like the, the yeah, the, you know, um, going to the archive room at Big Basin. And I just like, the first thing I thought of is like what it would be like for like me and Kathleen to, to witness something like that with our collections. And I just wanna say, I'm like, so sorry that you had to go through that, especially while also being evacuated yourself. I just, it's like, it's so much. <laughs> yeah, I, I mean, I never would have predicted my museum career, in my museum career that I would work in a place where one of the museums burned down completely. I mean, it's worst case scenario. Yeah. I, and you, you guys have been working so hard and I'm glad that you've been able to find some opportunity to um, do, you know, as Kathleen knows well, there's always lots of <laughs> cleaning and inventorying and picture taking to do. And so I'm, I'm sure that's, that's a, a happy um, aspect of it that you now have that done. Um, we did have a question come in from someone who works at our museum, which I'm sure is why this question was asked. Um, and it was, how did you keep track of what was going where, especially in the case of staff putting things in their cars under high pressure? There's just like so many moving pieces. How did you deal with that? It ended up um, a, a day or two after the main fire event, the interpretive staff sent out like a Google spreadsheet doc mm -hmm. to at least to all the interpreters. And so the interpreters put what they moved from where they moved it to and to where they moved it to. But then the key pieces of information was the interpreters would add, well, oh, I think that so-and-so from maintenance also moved this thing. 
Um, and then, so I was able to follow up on those things. And, and, you know, it was a lot to keep track of. And I don't think, I'll be honest, I don't think I ever really actually got a good handle on everything, where everything went. Um, but I knew enough to know that things were missing <laughs> from our visitor centers and to ask mm -hmm. around to try to get them back. And um, it was very hectic because some things you would think that some material would all be together, but no, some some items went to one park and some items went to another park and some items went to Sacramento. And so it was it was a bit of a puzzle to get wow. them all back together. <laughs> I have one other question that maybe we can um, do now and then we could hand things over to Kathleen for a moment to talk about. I think this is maybe a good transition question. Um, I'm just curious about, um, I love that you were able to go back to Big Basin and find objects from the collections and be able to like reintegrate them into your collections with new stories. <laughs> um, have you collected anything from Big Basin that wasn't in the collections? but that burned and that you now think has a role in the collections because it has this story? Or is that like a part of your process that you're going through right now? Yeah, I mean, I've, I've tried to salvage a few things. Um, for example, you know, we had this historic taxidermy collection, which all was destroyed, but you, when I was going through this, the space, I was finding the little metal armatures that were inside of the taxidermy and um, I could tell what it was because some of them had you know a little bird bone still wrapped up in metal wire and so I, I don't know what they are but I know that they're part of the taxidermy I mean I don't know which specimens they were maybe we can figure it out at some point but I saved maybe like five of those just thinking that they would be a cool visual representation of the fire. Um, you know, yeah. I say like, like the key lock box because that was burned, but not totally destroyed. Um, and then the little, there was a case full of um, drawers with insect specimens. And the only thing that survived were the little metal tags on the front of each drawer. Mm -hmm. So I saved a few of those. Um, so a few things that I feel like maybe nobody else cares about, but I care about. Oh, and then, but also we did, we, and I don't, I should have included a picture of it here. We did save a big sort of six foot long section of the big basin entrance sign. Yeah. Um, and I think that that will definitely be reused to interpret the story at some point in the future. Yeah. And some, Steve was just wondering if there are, um, you know, plans to have a future display. And I'm sure there are. <laughs> it's just, there's so many other things to do in the meantime, huh? I mean, I think it'll definitely be part of the new Big Basin yeah. Visitor Center area whenever that happens. Um, now, right now we're planning to reopen the Rancho Del Oso Welcome Center, the one that's, as you're going into the park, it's on the left yeah. of the marsh. Um, so we're, we're redesigning the exhibits for that space now. And so we're going to include the CZU story in that, but we wow. might not have too many objects in it, but it will definitely be part of the story um, there on display. <sighs> well, I think this is a good, we're going to have time for more questions, maybe <laughs> if we go a little longer past seven. Um, but I want to make sure that we bring in Kathleen because this all kind of connects to what she's prepared for us too, which is that our museum was also touched by the fire in a very different way. Um, and so Kathleen, why don't you share, share a little yeah. bit about that. So let me go ahead and share my screen. Um, we've been planning this event for a couple, for a month or so, and I still wasn't quite prepared for like the gut-wrenching feeling of seeing those burned archival cabinets. Um, and yeah, so many, I have so many follow-up questions from your presentation, Jenny, that was really great. Um, we did wanna talk a little bit about our response to the fires. Um, and I really liked how, um, you know, Jenny ended her presentation on disaster preparedness and incorporating lessons learned into future planning. Um, that's a huge component of disaster planning is that sort of cyclical nature um, of, 
of incorporating practical lessons learned um, into you know how you can be more prepared for the next time. Um, and uh, I was going to talk start by talking a little bit about that. Um, you can see here a pop up display of our CZU Lightning Complex collection, um, which is one of our major sort of collections related responses to this fire, which I'm going to kind of elaborate on. Um, but to start, I just wanted to talk about how like you know the museum. Um, was responding last August. Um, uh, it, this picture um, is from August 20th. So I think the same day that Jenny's picture of evacuating things from Wilder came from. Um, and it's my yard where I was used to working at that time during um, sort of COVID work from home policy days, as I was first really digging into disaster planning, training and learning and improving our plan and writing up the evacuation, preservation and salvage components for our collection specifically. Um, and so, uh, you know, as the sky over my usual workplace was turning orange and ash was falling outside the ceiling, I was writing up one of our first collections priority lists, which Jenny kind of mentioned, which is this really difficult pr process of choosing the most important things out of a list of important things so that when the time comes when you can only carry certain things, um, you carry the right ones, the ones that are going to help you serve your mission as much as possible going forward. Um, as we were sort of talking about these different experiences we all had from the fire, one thing we were just thinking about is like how this was just one other disaster that we were sort of all involved in. Um, we were having a lot of conversations as a staff about like how everyone was and what we were doing and how we were responding. And I think that Marisa actually took this picture, um, which is something I think she can talk a little bit more about just realizing you want to chime in Marisa. Sure. Yeah, no, I, it's, you know, we all have pictures like this, but I, yeah, I woke up that morning, looked outside and was like, oh my gosh, this was actually one of the early, this was maybe on the Tuesday or on Wednesday or a little earlier when the sky was just starting to really um, show evidence of the fires. And I just, yeah, I remember launching out of bed and running to the museum just because it felt like um, an important thing to capture um, for our story while we were all kind of like figuring out, yeah, what do we do? And how do we respond to like a really a historic moment? And I know that that was the same time we were having our um, museum anniversary event, our 115th anniversary. And so we're thinking about, you know, um, just what it means to be preserving a legacy through a century and beyond, which is um, when, when you don't know what's going to happen to those things in the future, kind of like how Jenny was talking about Big Basin being one of the oldest state parks and, um, you know, trying on like a smaller scale, being aware that we were at a distance from the fires. I don't want to minimize the kind of danger that we were not in, um, but also just being aware that we wouldn't want to be unprepared. There have been so many places throughout California, especially lately, where people never thought a fire was going to be coming directly to their doors, and then it did. Um, and in general, we were just having conversations as a staff about like how to respond to this moment and making sure that we were doing things that were relevant, um, you know, from an outreach perspective that we were meeting our community's needs, but then also from a collections perspective that we were meeting, you know, the needs of our future selves and how we were responding in terms of collecting. Um, and it was our colleague Liz Broughton, visitor services manager, who I think made sure that we would preserve one of these masks for our institutional archives. Um, and that's her vaccination sticker from a couple months later. Um, or one that she provided to us. Um, and so, uh, you know, Liz clearly had this sort of collection building perspective on her mind, even when she personally had to evacuate her home in the San Lorenzo Valley. Um, and so she was the first one to start a conversation of how this perspective of a relationship that is natural disasters. Um, and so we thought it sounded like a good fit, but it, it was something that we wanted to do as thoughtfully and carefully as possible. Um, so I had done some research already kind of in this regard and was looking for examples of um, how you might collect around a natural disaster responsibly. We had examples on sort of the national level, um, like the Smithsonian Katrina collections. Um, and you know, there are research papers these curators put together on the process of collecting from such a cataclysmic and painful, complicated events and they have portraits of damaged homes and a basket that was used to rescue someone with a helicopter. And then there's even sort of like buttons um, that are commemorative and talk about fundraising efforts. Um, we also, you know, looked locally around at the ways different community institutions here were responding. And you can see an example of, you know, our friends at the San Lorenzo Valley Museum blog, who's been very active in today's comments and love the depth of knowledge that you bring to every conversation, Lisa. Um, 
sharing, you know, even, you know, allowing people in this like historic moment who were dealing with so many things to still connect to their local history and read an interesting article about um, a historic fire in the mountains um, to, you know, the Museum of Art and History providing an opportunity to tell these really personal stories of loss. Um, and these are just two examples of many um, and a lot of the cultural institutions and community groups and individuals in our area at this time were actually more focused you know, or while they were doing this, were also focused on getting folks the food, shelter, and information they needed as they dealt with the evacuation from, and in some cases, the destruction of their homes. Um, so as we're sort of, again, like thinking about this strategy, how are we going to decide how to collect these things? Um, we especially wanted to think about what it made sense for us to collect as a natural history museum. Um, a lot of these things are, have sort of a more historic focus or these sort of mixed stories. Um, and this is something we found inspiration for in our own collections. Um, we have a selection of items that I'm sure many of you have seen in our Loma Prieta collection um, that range from commemorative, commemorative bricks um, that were given to volunteers who helped clear the damage from downtown to bumper stickers celebrating um, sort of surviving this experience um, to a rock that is not pictured that illustrates evidence of fault movement. Um, and we were able to use these items, some of which are clearly not traditional natural history specimens, to help connect you know, with our community over this experience, over, you know, on countless times from lectures like this one that Greg Griggs gave on perils in paradise and local natural disasters to our 2019 Loma Prieta commemorative exhibit, Sense of Scale. Um, and so together we synthesized all this research and experience um, and conversations with colleagues who were personally affected um, by these fires and, you know, also considering our storage constraints. It'd be really hard for us to collect a giant sign, even if one uh, an opportunity presented itself um, and our commitment to sort of natural history related items. And we developed this, uh, a priorities document that sort of summer. Um, as a tool to communicate out about our interest in collecting things, not just through like these traditional outreach channels like social media, you can see this post here. Um, but also, you know, reaching out to various networks as any staff members felt interested, um, you know, or new people who might be interested in this kind of a thing. Um, and we hope that these articulations demonstrated how thoughtful we wanted to be um, to bring, you know, a very like respectful and responsible attitude to collecting something around um, this, this complex of an event. Um, some examples of what we put together are in our collection were this um, fundraising sticker by a local artist in Clara Spars that went to support the Amamutsen Land Trust burning program um, to uh, response-based materials, such as this operations map from the Cal Fire Call Center that Marisa volunteered at, um, to a variety of natural materials that were directly affected by the fires. Um, a lot of these you can see on display right now throughout August at our collections close-up uh, CZU Lightning Complex Fire Pop-Up. Um, but that wasn't our only response. Um, you know, we're still really committed to the collection of data that can inform the natural history perspective on this disaster. And for that, I wanted to tag in Marisa. Yeah, thanks, Kathleen. It has been quite a year, lots of decisions. Um, and yeah, just when the fires came through last August, it really was one of those, like, what do we do today? <laughs> what do you know, what do we do for our community? What do we do for the museum? There's all these different lever levels. And uh, like you mentioned, we were um, commemorating our 115th anniversary this week, the week that it occurred. And we were inviting people to join us for this virtual celebration, but you know, we were still celebrating nonetheless. And what do you do when our community is going through something like this? And what do you do with, you know, an event like that? And so those are some of the early decisions we had to make. Um, and then as things sort of, you know, the dust or the ash started to settle, um, we also started to think about what is our role in interpreting this natural event. And um, I started having a lot of conversations with a lot of different researchers and a lot of different land managers and um, people who had different kinds of skin in the game in terms of like, what were they were interested in? What did they need to learn about? Um, what were their goals? for after the fires and there was a lot of different goals. And um, based on those many conversations, we developed the CZU Lightning Complex and Community Science Project, which is a long-term monitoring effort. We're trying to engage our community to make observations within the burn zone to um, deepen our community understanding and help these people who are, uh, who are the land managers, who are 
figuring out what to do in these spaces in the wake of these fires. Um, and so we, we developed this uh, project and part of it is helping people understand how to do community science. And so we take people out into the burn zone, we give them access, we help them understand what they're seeing, and then we also help them understand what to do with that data. So this is an example of one of our um, community scientists who went on a walk with us this spring, taking pictures at the Bonnie Dune Ecological Reserve um, so that she could then upload them to iNaturalist, which is the platform that we're using. So this is a di digital collection. Um, and it's existing on iNaturalist and it's in partnership with the California Native Plant Society. So this is their fire followers project. And our role as the museum is to help train and engage our community to contribute to this project. Um, and you can see that there have been thousands of observations made since August. These are the most recent observations made. And these are made from people who live in the burn zone. So they're surrounded by this every day, people who um, find opportunities to like to go and explore. There are some parts of the burn zone that have opened up to the public and we've been taking people on walks at some of those places. Um, we went to parts of Butno. I think I've heard so many different ways I'm supposed to say it. I'm gonna say Butno for now. Um, we went to Butno State Park a couple of weeks ago. Um, we are going to Rancho del Oso this weekend with a group. We've been visiting the Bonnie Dune Ecological Reserve a lot and I'm talking to um, an interpreter at Henry Cowell about visiting Fall Creek. So um, we're trying to help people find access um, to this to the burn zone so that they can help collect data, but also because it's a constantly changing situation. The way that it looks today is different than the way it's gonna look in three months and different from the way it looked three months prior. Um, and every year it's good, that's useful information of what, how our landscape is responding to this event. So um, we're wanting to do this as frequently as possible. And we've got a lot more in store um, also. And then tonight's event is also a part of, um, of that process. This month is focusing more on the learning aspect because that's really what we're all about is education and connecting people with nature and science. And so um, offering opportunities for people to deepen their understanding through learning, um, through being with their community in nature is really important to us. So um, anyways, that's what we're, that's one of our responses and collecting that data is another form of collection, um, if you will. And uh, it's been, it's been really interesting to be out there in the burn zone with members of our community, those who have evacuated and those who hadn't, you know, but we're still impacted by this event as being a part of this community. And um, really just we're kind of like on the outskirts of it for this past year and, and now finally able to have access to, to see it for their own eyes, um, which I think is really powerful. Um, so. And um, we are a little after seven, but I think we can stick around for a little bit longer to go through some questions and have a bit more discussion. Um, so if anyone uh, joining us has questions, put them in the chat. And then I know, Kathleen, you have a lot of questions for Jenny, too. <laughs> Do you want to start with a question? <laughs> yeah, the first one is, uh, you talked a lot about, I really liked getting um, to hear the different story of the different state parks. Um, and you kind of, we've seen some of like the breadth of the collection that you're working with. Um, but I didn't realize the extent to which not only there were state park collections, but also that, that they were like locally stored. Um, and I was wondering if you could maybe tell us a little bit more about the scope of those, maybe starting with the bear that we can see behind your shoulder in this picture of your office. <laughs> well, the great thing about the state parks collections is that they're so varied. You know, it's everything from memorabilia to ethnographic items, to natural history, to farming equipment, to the bear, which is a recent donation uh, for our, our park called the Castro Adobe, which is out near Watsonville. Um, part of the lore of the Castro Adobe is this idea of the bear and bull fights. And um, so the interpreters were, were hoping to get a bear skin to tell that story. It's kind of a gruesome story. I don't really, I find it a little, you know, unpleasant. But um, uh, one of the docents had 
their own bear skin that they were using uh, for the interpretation. And so we were offered a, a bear skin and decided it was a good time to actually get one that we own. And so this is, you know, a brand new acquisition as of just a month ago. And also now that I think about it, it's our first acquisition where the original owner passed away because of COVID. And so it's our first COVID related sort of gift, which makes it kind of heavy and historic as well. Um, but yeah, like I was saying, you know, in the introduction, it's maybe about 15 parks that have historic collections, you know, um, and this, the way I define it is like things that are tracked in our museum collections management database. <laughs> um, and then, but then also we have these visitor center spaces like, like Butano, which I've, I was saying Butano. Yeah. And then I switched back to saying Butano because somebody was trying to tell me it's sort of like saying, do you say Paso Robles or do you <laughs> say Paso Robles? You know, and so I was like, well, I still don't know, but I'm going to start saying Butano. <laughs> yeah, I've heard, I've heard a lot of different reasons, um, yeah. <laughs> but yeah, I think it's okay. I think unless yeah. someone strongly disagrees and they want to put that in the chat, that's okay. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> but um, like a place like Butano, that visitor center, and also the Portola visitor center is full of stuff, but it's not actually cataloged into the database yet. Mm -hmm. That's part of one of my plans, um, which also will require establishing proof of ownership as well. So mm -hmm. that's why it's not quite a priority right now. But um, yeah, there's a lot of parks that have, you know, there's a lot of parks in our area that have these museum collections that not a lot of people really know about except for outside of maybe Wilder Ranch, you know. Yeah, yeah well, and you, I think like, you know, you shared pictures of maintenance staff installing a mountain lion and it just goes to show, I mean, you have so many collections of objects that you're responsible for yeah. and there's just so many. <laughs> and so it's understandable that you, you know, you have help from other departments, but it's a big task. It's understandable that there's still a lot of work. To I mean, we don't have like, unlike a traditional museum, we don't have a preparator staff or preparation staff. We don't have those people that are, it's their profession to install artwork. Mm. You know, so that tends to fall to me, but then I can't lift a giant, uh, well, maybe I could lift the mountain lion, but that rock that it's on was actually pretty heavy. So, um, yeah. and also the mountain lions tend to be way up high because they're always looking down. Yes, on ours is way up high, yeah. <laughs> and one thing that I thought I really appreciated you pointing out was the um, challenge of sometimes if you're gonna be moving a thing, you have to weigh the risk to it of the you know disaster versus the risk of it just being handled. Whereas I feel like in our homes, we can be like, okay, this is my stuff, I'm gonna grab it. Um, you don't have to necessarily be thinking about just how like exposure to touching it in the same way you think about with the museum ob object can itself be damaging. And I know when I was like walking around our museum exhibits and being like, all of these are important to us. So how would we relocate something like the Laura Hecox cabinet? Like how do we develop strategies to move like this very heavy like historic wooden cabinet that's got tons of tiny shells in it without it getting further damaged and and then yeah we also have a mountain lion that's looking <laughs> I down mean, at people from above it's it's opened us up to a bigger discussion of having an emergency supply cache and um do we have one giant well relatively giant cache like a shipping container full of boxes and packing material in Felton at the district headquarters, or do we have smaller caches at every park? Because as we saw when we were evacuating, it's like a right, you have to evacuate right in the moment and have those supplies on hand. So yeah, it's having just the materials to properly mm -hmm. pack the collections is a whole nother part of the, the yeah. whole piece. You know what I was thinking too, is that we do, I mean, we have a lot of museums in the Santa Cruz areas there are a lot of trained people in how to handle collections objects and it would be 
meet to, you know, have some sort of response planned out where like, you've got a list of phone numbers that you can call that could help you, <laughs> you know, if you needed to evacuate again, or if the San Lorenzo Valley Museum needed to evacuate yeah. again. Um, Cause I know there are I mean, a lot of good. It's a really good idea. And, and I think Kathleen has been trying to get us sort of organized well, in that way. Me and several other folks, um, there is a like sort of local archives, history and collections management group um, that has been like meeting and talking and we're going to be doing some disaster preparedness training in September. And then I know there's a local museum group where around some point last year we were talking about, you know, putting together a spreadsheet being like, I have X amount of freezer space to slow the mm -hmm. deterioration for damaged objects, this kind of thing. So mm -hmm. it's definitely in the works and it definitely is interesting, especially in Santa Cruz, because our geography, which is so stunning, presents so many unique challenges for how like, you know, in the mountains, it's not like a lot of civilians would be allowed to go up to help other people in the event of that kind of an evacuation. And I know we had some really nuanced conversations on like, if we're under an evacuation and staff have volunteered to be part of an evacuation of collections processes, like what level of evacuation and how close are we comfortable like asking people to do that, you know, this versus all these sorts of nuances. Um, we also had a question that I'm in the chat that I'm curious about. Um, someone asking about the evacuation process and how like um, costs uh, work for that in the state park system. Like, is there a specific fund for these sorts of activities or? Um, you know, I think if we do get a, a cache of emergency supplies, it's gonna come from the main cultural resources people up in Sacramento, which is great. Um, all of the taxidermy conservation that we've done so far has been generously paid for by our cooperating associations, like um, the Portola and Castle Rock Foundation helped with conservation of the mountain lion there. And I think it's the Waddell Creek Association mm -hmm maybe it's Coastside Parks Association is gonna help with that owl with the very terribly um, bent head. Um, and then I think that some of the historic structures that did survive, like ones at Cascade Ranch have had some repair work to the actual structures done already. And a lot of that money has been coming from FEMA, go figure. Um, I'm not quite sure how, I'm not really in the loop on that, but that, and then also, you know, for Big Basin, there's going to be a lot of money coming from the state of California to rebuild the money. And maybe that some of that money comes from some of the various propositions, but it might also be just, it was earmarked in the budget for rebuilding Big Basin, which is great. And, um... This person who is curious is also like wondering if there's um, a good place to contribute towards if there is still like a need. So would you yeah. recommend that they look into those those partner funds, the yeah. nonprofits that help support the various state parks? I think that the Friends of Santa Cruz State Parks still, I mean, they had the main relief fund mm -hmm. and um, I believe there's still uh taking donations to that fund, especially now as we get to the one year anniversary. Um, I think they're still taking donations. I think that's the best way to, to donate your, your money. Um, I know I benefited from it a little bit because I was evacuated. So I applied to get um, just a little bit of relief money and that, and that helped me because I had to end up you know, renting something in town for three weeks. And so that little bit of money really helped with that expense. So, so yeah, yeah, Friends of Santa Cruz State Parks that's has a great. fire relief fund. Yeah, yeah, that's, I know there's so many people who work for state parks that were, that were impacted and yeah. lost their homes. And so I'm glad you guys are getting yeah. um, support in that way. And we're pretty far beyond time. So even though I know we have a lot we had a lot of other questions, <laughs> but that's okay. Um, and uh, what I will do is send a follow-up email to everyone who registered today. 
Um, I'll wait until I've got the recording up, but I'll include the, the link to this recording so you can go and rewatch. I'll also include um, some resources and Jenny's contact information so that um, people or Jenny, if you there's a different way that you'd like people to get in touch about donating objects. Um, no, I'm, I'm, I would definitely be the person to get in touch with. Okay, great. So I'll include that. Objects. Great. Um, and I just want to thank you so much, Jenny, for sharing these stories and for all that you did last year and throughout the year and for the, the big projects you still have um, going on here. We all really appreciate it. Um, well, thank you for having me and, and letting me tell the story. And, and again, thank you to all of the museum members, you know, for their support as well. Yeah. And uh, we hope to see you all at a future program. Again, we've got a lot more going on for this series and we are approaching the one year anniversary um, on the 16th, which is this coming Monday. Um, and uh, it all started with lightning as we know. And so if you've been curious about the weather behind that and um, what the future holds for weather and wildfire in our state, it just gives me chills just thinking about it, remembering waking up to that. Um, but we're gonna be talking with um, a weather scientist on Monday is our, is our next event for this year. So um, I hope to see you all soon. Thank you again and have a great night. Thank you. <laughs>